Gingivitis and periodontal disease <clears throat> is an unsightly, painful, inflammatory condition suffered uh, by millions of people around the world. Now, there's a few groups of people around the world that don't suffer from this at all. I've got the great pleasure today of having Kevin Stock, who's a practicing dentist, on as a guest today. We're going to be talking about gingivitis, periodontal disease, cavities, how many times a day you should brush and floss, and water pick, um, fluoride. Yeah, we're going to be talking about fluoride. I asked him before we started, and he said he ain't scared, and I, you know I ain't scared. So we're going to be talking about fluoride, the American Dental Association, and all their recommendations, maybe even mercury fillings. So if you have one of these problems or know someone who does, please hang out and let's talk about this. Let me bring our guest on. Dr. Stock, welcome. It is a pleasure to have you. Thank you for having me, Dr. Barry. Excited to be here. It's an honor uh, and looking forward to chatting. We've been trying to set this up for you guys watching for months. <laughs> and I'm busy. He's busy. But we finally got our, our schedules aligned. And so we're going to do this. Before we get started, um, let me just give you a chance to kind of introduce yourself and tell people who you are and what you're about. Yeah, my name is Kevin Stock. Uh, I am a dentist. I would say untraditional uh, dentist and untraditional kind of career path. And we can talk a little bit about that if we want. But in, in general, my two areas of dentistry that I focused in is wow. pediatric dentistry. So I work for a company called Smile America Partners. And I do, they basically send me off rural Missouri where I'm treating kids um, throughout Missouri. And I do that part time. And the other half of my dental career has been in the area of dental sleep medicine, which is this niche area of dentistry um, that treats obstructive sleep apnea and snoring, known as sleep disordered breathing. So right out of dental school, I started a private practice doing just dental sleep medicine and the pediatric. And those, those, are, those have been my two niches. Uh, but anyone that knows me online knows I've kind of been a health and fitness nutrition nut for much longer, 20 plus years, which started as an overweight kid and has evolved over <clears> the decades. Absolutely. In rural Missouri, do you see a lot of Mountain Dew mouth like you see in rural Tennessee? We see a lot of Mountain Dew mouth. Uh, yeah, a lot, a lot of standard American diet mouth is what I would call it. So sad. So sad. So we're going to start off talking about gingivitis and periodontal disease and picking that apart. Uh, I've, I've actually done a couple of videos on my YouTube channel about gingivitis and basically from the thousands of anecdotal comments and questions that I've gotten over the years of doing this YouTube thing. I've seen this very, very strong signal, very apparent that your diet plays a huge role in gingivitis and periodontal disease. So let's start with that topic and go from there. Do you think diet has anything to do with periodontal disease and gingivitis? I would say it has the primary thing to do with these things um, besides smoking, which it actually took a long time for the dentist to, to figure that out, that that was a primary cause of periodontal disease as well. But besides that, like diet is the primary cause of both gingivitis and periodontal disease. And we can also kind of lump in cavities to that as well, because these all have the same etiology. But it is this diet that in the case of gingivitis and periodontal disease, these, this is the gum disease. And I guess for a little bit of background for people, gingivitis it's easy way to think about it is the early stage of periodontal disease. That's where you're starting to get this inflammation. Your gums are bleeding. You notice they're red. If you floss, they're bleeding. And well, one, that should be strange. Like your mouth is bleeding. So that should be a red flag for people. Uh, and then periodontitis, which is like the gingivitis can progress to periodontitis. And this is where it's more severe. That is where literally the bone, your teeth sits in bone. And literally the bone is being eaten away by this bacterial infection. And that's the number one cause of tooth loss in adults because we have this chronic inflation, infl inflammatory process going on in the mouth, eating away at the bone. Uh, and then when the bone's eaten away, the tooth has nothing but but soft tissue holding it in. So those, those teeth will just fall right on out. Yeah. And it's it's it can be devastating to a person's personal appearance, but also their health. It's very, very dangerous to have just chronic infection in your mouth. Now, I'll tell you. How I can how this interview came to be. I'm a allopathically trained, classically trained medical doctor. And so in medical school, very often medical schools and dental schools share the same campus. Mm -hmm. And at the University of Tennessee and Memphis Health Science Center, there was a huge rivalry 
between the medical school and the dental school. Uh, and so medical students would, were, were like constantly bashing on dentists, like, well, I'm sorry, your MCAT wasn't good enough that you had to go to dental school. And then dentists are like, yeah, you enjoy that 10 care Medicaid because I'm going to get paid yeah. for what I do. So there's all this back and forth and there was tag football um, in which collarbones and ulnas were broken. Yep between the medical students and the dental students. And I remember very clearly, it was I, I love bathroom graffiti. Maybe one day I'm going to write a coffee table book of, of bathroom graffiti from all over the world. But there was this one, I'm sure it was a medical student wrote this. It said the entire, the entirety of dental education, teeth, number one, they are hard. Number two, they are white. Number three, you chew with them. Congratulations. Here's your diploma. And there was an arrow pointing down to the toilet paper dispenser that so, but now, as a practicing doctor, I was at one point morbidly obese and pre-diabetic, and I had quite a bit of gingivitis. And so I, I had this negative connotation. I hate going to the dentist, full disclosure, but also from medical school, dental school interactions. And I was like, I'm not going to the dentist. I don't give a damn, whatever, you know. But after every time I brushed my teeth, they, I would have bleeding. I had some recession starting. And then I, when I discovered low-carb, primal, paleo, then keto, it occurred to me one day, you know what? My teeth, my gums don't bleed anymore now that I, I've been keto for months. That's weird, huh? And so then as part of trying to rediscover a proper human diet, I started looking at archaeology, anthropology, paleoanthropology, and I found this pattern that when they when they looked at fossils that were older than 15,000 years, very often the teeth were pristine. There's not a single cavity, a.k.a. dental carry. There was no sign of dental abscess. There was no sign of malocclusion. They literally had perfect teeth. And I'm like, what happened 12, 12-ish 12 thousand years ago that all of a sudden our teeth became crowded? Everybody had at least one uh, dental abscess, uh, in which can be deadly without antibiotics. It can kill you dead. Mm -hmm. they, they, they had just their mouth, you know, earlier now, after 12,000 years ago, mouth, mouths were riddled with cavities, multiple teeth missing. So what happened in our history of Homo sapiens sapien that before 15,000 years ago, our teeth were pristine and perfect. And they were basically, you could go by the, the UT uh, dental school graduation criteria. They're white, they're hard, you chew with them. You didn't have to do anything to them. Yeah, they just were, and they did their job, and you never had any trouble with them. What happened about somewhere between eight and 15,000 years ago, depending on where you live, what happened to our teeth? Yeah, there was no need for a dentist in the Stone Age, uh, which is interesting. So there's a lot of things there. What people don't realize is we have a hard time keeping our teeth for one lifetime today, but teeth preserve for millions of years in the fossil record. They're 97% mineral. And often when we look at archaeology, because like you, I'm fascinated by dental archaeology, the fossil record, uh, what we do is we see some very interesting things. Uh, but when these teeth are often like, th this is what we had, like the most fossils we have are like teeth <laughs> of these skeletons. So we learn a lot about our past through the teeth, which is interesting. And I like to say like teeth, you know, tell us a lot about what we should or shouldn't be eating. Uh, it's often the canary in the coal mine. When, when we put the wrong things in the mouth, we first, we see those problems first happen in the mouth. For example, we'll see gingivitis first, and then we may see periodontitis. And then by the time you have a heart attack, we finally see, ah, the same etiology ended up as a heart attack, but a little bit late. Uh, so, but back to the fossil record and you brought up so many interesting things there. Cause I, my brother, he, well, one of my brothers, I, uh, there's four of us, but the one who's a one year older than me, he's a medical doctor. He's an ophthalmologist. But it's interesting because I'd say he's one of the smartest people I know, you know, full ride, WashU medical school, ophthalmology residency, but he's struggled with a weight till to this day. And, you know, I'm starting to rub off on him. He's now keto moving towards carnivorous, carnivorous and making strides. But yeah, like something that they're not teaching, I guess, in medicine or if what they are teaching is like not solving the problem is, you know, the smartest of the doctors are having weight problems. Absolutely. And if you're having weight <clears throat> problems, uh, I, I even think most people will agree. Like if you're having overweight or obese, you're now moving in the upper echelon of all kinds of risk. Yep. Uh, so back to the archaeology, what we see is a couple interesting things in the fossil record. Like you mentioned, prior to the agricultural revolution, roughly 12,000 years ago, humans, homo sapiens, uh, we are 
mostly, first of all, the, the down record, like you said, no cavities and no abscesses. So if you had cavities, we could see that in the teeth. Abscesses, we'd see holes in the alveolar bone. We don't see that. We don't see malocclusion. All 32 teeth fit in. The wisdom teeth, for the third, you know, we have 32 teeth. Most people may not realize that, but those wisdom teeth, uh, they were fitting in our mouth. So there's plenty of room for them where today, like mine, they got taken out when I was 13 years old. I <laughs> didn't have room for them. So what's going on here? Uh, and the root cause here is diet. Uh, mostly so when we get to that but so twelve thousand years ago big change that we see in, this, in the fossil record coincides with the agricultural revolution the cultivation of crops and the rise of a particular non-essential macronutrient starting to take up more and more of the diet that would be carbohydrates and carbohydrates are the necessary ingredient for the bacteria in your mouth to ferment into acids that lead to cavities and abscesses uh, so that's what we see in the fossil record and we also see it in an interesting thing. So when you go to the dentist, you don't like going, I understand. But one of the things your dentist or the hygienist will do is they start scraping on your teeth. You know what they're doing? They're scraping off dental calculus. And you know what? That actually also survives in the fossil record. And the dental calculus is actually, it's like a snapshot of your oral microbiome in time. And so what scientists have been able to do is sequence dental calculus throughout history. And we see prior to the agricultural revolution, when we sequence dental calculus, there's, we have this certain oral biota and it's balanced. And at the turn of the agricultural revolution, we see that calculus change. We see a rise of karyogenic strands of bacteria, notably strep mutants. And then we also see a second major change that coincides with the industrial revolution, where not only do we have a rise in these karyogenic bacteria, but they become predominant. And so almost all these fossil records post-industrial revolution, we have dysbiosis in the mouth. And that's what's leading to you know, the drastic fall in dental health, where cavities are today the most common disease in the world. I yes. recently said that on a talk I was given and someone came up to me and that's like that statement startled them more than anything because they never even thought of cavities as a disease yep. because it's so normalized. Like if you don't have cavities, you are in the far minority. Uh, so uh, as a little bit, a little bit of the archaeology and happy to talk more about that because I, I mean, I'm fascinated with it like I think you are as well. Yeah, it's really fascinating. And that looking at that is what brought me to it, understanding oral health and the microbiome and teeth and just how important they are as canaries in the coal mine. As you said, that's that's why we're doing this live together is because I was like, what the heck? Why did nobody have cavities or abscesses before 15,000 years ago? That's really weird. And you're right. It, it, cavities, dental caries are so ubiquitous today that most people just think, well, that's just something that happens. There, there's no cause for that. You know, maybe maybe your teeth didn't mineralize right. Maybe you didn't have enough fluoride in your diet. Uh, <laughs> but the, people just get cavities. Every kid has cavities. That's normal. And it, it may be common, but I don't think it's normal at exactly. all. And I'm currently doing two experiments right now with Beckett, my uh, three-year-old, and with Bonnie Blue, our one-year-old, they are both eating a, what we would consider a ketovore diet, very, very low, no grains whatsoever, no sugars whatsoever, maybe at a birthday party, right? You might have a bite of cake or a, a donut hole, but on a daily basis, they have zero sugar and grains or vegetable seed oils. And we brush their teeth once a day with a non-fluoridated tooth, toothpaste, and that's it. That's literally all we're doing. And we're going to run this experiment and we're going to see if these two kids have just cavities like every other kid in the world. I predict they will not. What do you think about my experiment? Do you, what, what's your prediction? I mean, not only would I do that experiment, but that is what I, I wouldn't even consider an experiment. That would be like my default. Uh, and I can tell you, treating pediatric patients for the last 10 years and the brother I mentioned, he's got a sixth kid on the way. I am around kids all the time. And limiting the sugar we can talk about the teeth but from a behavioral standpoint and being a parent i can tell you that will do wonders all i hear about is when's the next snack when's this sugar treat that's all these kids talk about and yep. so from a, a behavioral standpoint and sanity as a parent i think it plays a big role but when it comes to like the teeth and oral health um eating a ketovore diet you're not gonna get cavities you're simply like the evidence for <laughs> the evidence for cavities and increasing carbohydrates is extremely robust, like to the point where no dentist is really, we're not arguing that we know the, the disease, the pathway, like how this is happening. Uh, so, so in essence, in order to argue for a high carbohydrate diet, you are in essence arguing 
that a diet that is we know is bad for your oral health is somehow good for your systemic health. To me, that should like raise a red flag. Like that does not pass the common sense test. Absolutely. So I Absolutely. would not be uh, afraid for your experiment. The cavities are not caused by a fluoride deficiency. Point blank. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Now, for those of you watching this on YouTube, we're actually recording this live inside of our private group. And so our group members, our tribe members will get to ask Dr. Stock questions. Uh, if you'd like that privilege in the future, when I uh, when I interview other leading authorities on different health, medical, nutrition topics, consider becoming a member. There's a link down in the show notes. Uh, tribe member Nicole says, well, eating a low carb diet reduce the production of tartar uh, can it reverse gingivitis? That's the question of the day is if you come into what we call a proper human diet with gingivitis and it's even progressed to periodontal disease, can you slow it down? Can you reverse it with a proper human diet, which is, in my opinion, either a keto, ketovore or carnivore diet? So there's two parts to that question. One of them is very easy to answer. The other one's a little bit more robust. The, the second, the latter part of the question, can it reverse gingivitis? Absolutely. I would expect it to reverse gingivitis. Uh, not only could it, I, I would expect that. Reversing periodontal disease, that's another question. Uh, because can you, It's periodontal disease is kind of defined by a loss of attachment. And so that includes the bone. You get the periodontal ligament, which attaches to the tooth. And classically, you're trained. Once you lose this attachment, there's no getting it back. Yep. I can tell you from working with a lot of people doing carnivore diets, uh, Anecdotally, you know, N equal one experiments, people regain attachment. And so gain some attachment back, reversing periodontal disease to some extent. So I do think even that is possible. Uh, but the idea is you'll at least, you know, stop the progression of periodontal disease. You can definitely reverse gingivitis. Uh, so that's the answer to that part. Tartar is a, a, a longer question. <laughs> Tartar, also known as dental calculus. Uh, this kind of goes to the idea of the oral microbiome. And some people think, like we need to sterilize the oral microbiome. We need to take these mouthwashes full of alcohol. We got to kill all the bacteria out. Bacteria in the mouth play a very important role in keeping us healthy. And there's one classic like over example, but there's lots of other examples. And that is nitric oxide production. So we have these bacteria in our mouth that will convert nitrate into nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is this very, very important molecule for vascular health as well as many other things. But 25% of your body systemic nitric oxide is coming from your mouth. And so if you just nuke these bacteria, you you could see, a, you can and do see acute rises in blood pressure. So because you don't have the, the vasodilation that you should have with, from this nitric oxide production. So that is related to tartar because tartar is not necessarily bad. <laughs> so if you have periodontal disease and you have all this calculus tartar buildup, it can actually exacerbate it. If you just have some buildup and, but a, a balanced, ecosystem bacteria that can be not pathogenic. In fact, wild animals eating their wild, normal, natural diet will have some uh, calculus buildup. We, as we mentioned in the fossil record, we have these human skulls, these dentitions, no cavities, no abscesses, no malocclusion, all the teeth fitting in by all measures, very healthy oral mouth that we can tell from the teeth and the skeleton. But they also had calculus. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, and the causes of what could cause some people to have more calculus or less calculus, we can talk about that. I can tell you on a carnivore diet, people experience vastly different things early on. Some people will see tartar buildup in our early on, which tends to go away. Other people see total remission of tartar buildup. So I, there's probably equal anecdotes on each side. The last kind of thing on this uh, is I did shoot a video. It's on YouTube that goes into more of like why someone might build up more calculus or not calculus on a carnivore diet if someone's interested. So that, it's like 15 minutes. We can we can go through that here if interested, but uh, it's just another resource people can use. Excellent. And I noticed when I went carnivore, I didn't have any problem with tartar buildup at all. Nisha, my wife, when she went carnivore, which she then used to reverse, put her Hashimoto's thyroiditis into remission, she had this accelerated tartar buildup on the inside of her bottom incisors that she, it freaked her out. Right. And so she went to the dentist and the, the hygienist said, have you been eating a lot more meat lately? She's like, well, yes, actually. <laughs> and, and so they, they cleaned the tartar and it has not happened again. It was just yep. that one time when she was converting to carnivore, there was no danger, no damage. They got it off. And then now she hasn't had any recurrence of that. So let's, let's 
really hammer this gingivitis. So if somebody has gingivitis, which is bleeding inflamed gums with some receding gum line, and they adopt a proper human diet, carnivore, ketovore, keto, meat heavy keto, that's you're saying that it's it's not a surprise that that stops and reverses the gingivitis. That's the expected outcome. I would literally expect I someone that had gingivitis and went carnivore and it didn't fix it. I would be shocked. And it's similar to where our, I you know I have an open invitation to people and we'll, we'll hammer out gingivitis as well. But I have an open invitation. All my social media is I'm like if you go to a dentist and you have your X-rays and you don't have a cavity, right? Historic history and you go to a carnivore diet and you develop a cavity. You send me those x-rays. I will personally evaluate them. I don't actually think it's possible for right. you to develop a cavity eating a carnivore diet unless you're eating lots of milk. <laughs> Almost right. the only thing that could potentially right. cause cavities in this situation. Yeah. And now, comes- is there is there research that exists? Because I, I currently believe that milk is absolutely good for human beings up until the point where they're four, five, six, seven years old. And then mimicking how we lived in the wild, because we, we from some of the anthropology, it looks like that most hunter-gatherer societies wean their kids at about four years, four to five. And so uh, currently, Beckett, my three-year-old, he sucks the bottom out of the goat milk container every day. And now Bonnie's being weaned off the breast, and she's, she's developing that love for goat milk. And we know that, that milk contains endorphins and casomorphines that encourage kids to drink milk because that's their only nutrition. Right. Mm-hmm. And, but it seems like, so we know, we know, and so milk's full of sugar. It's got lactose in it, which breaks down to glucose and galactose. So why doesn't that chronic daily sugar exposure in the first four years of life, why doesn't that lead to cavities? Like when you continue to expose your teeth to sugar after that kind of four year, five year old cutoff, what changes? Is it the microbiome in the mouth that changes? Is it is it something else that changes? That is a super interesting question. And there's it's all kinds of topics we can actually get out of that. So for one is you can develop cavities uh, from milk as an infant and baby. It's called baby, mouth, baby bottle mouth. So if you put mm-hmm. a baby down mm-hmm. with a bottle, even if it's breast milk, it can cause severe cavities. Because one of the w- ways cavities are caused is you have the carbohydrate it, it bacteria fermented into acids and those acids are what eat holes in your teeth. Now, frequency is a big thing here. Meaning if you just do it once, you have this acid attack, the body will remineralize it. Meaning saliva basically is our cardinal remineralization technique. And there's going to be no problem. But if you have that acid attack going all day long, that's how you get cavities. So a classic example is sh- or, um, sodas. Like this, the, basically the worst thing you can do for your teeth because sodas are acidic already. They have phosphoric acid. Uh, so it's already acidic. They have sugar, which is going to be fermented into acid. It's liquid. So you're not going to chew, which is not going to stimulate saliva. So you're not going to have the protection. And so, and you tend to sip on it throughout the day. And so you have this acid attack, which takes, it takes a Red Bull, 22 minutes, I believe, to reestablish normal pH in, in the mouth. But if you take, so if you take a sip of Red Bull every 22 minutes throughout the day, your mouth is in an acidic environment the entire day. So you're going to have this um, risk of cavities. So when it comes to breastfeeding or bottle feeding, breastfeeding is really what you want to do for infants if you possibly can. Um, it's normally done every, you know, three hours. It, it varies as time goes on, but it's not constant. Right. And for the first six months, they don't have any teeth. So it's not a huge deal early on. Right. Uh, and then the food also has, so breast milk, for example, it has calcium. You're going to get the calcium, the phosphate. You're going to have the remineralization that you need to kind of combat this potentially cariogenic effect from the sugar. Um, so it, cavities are this, it is this fight, for example, demineralization from acid versus remineralization from saliva, more or less. Uh, and so that balance will not get disrupted by breastfeeding, uh, only for doing something more unnatural, like putting a baby down with a bottle, which will cause cavities. Yeah. And so when the baby goes to sleep, there's a decrease in sal- salivary production, right? Yes. And so if that bottle is in their mouth and they've got a mouthful of milk and they go to sleep and it stays in there for hour, an hour or more, they don't have that natural reacidification of the mouth from the saliva. 
so yeah, absolutely milk is an appropriate food for humans up until four, five, six, seven years of age, but don't let them go to bed with the bottle. And, and that, that's how you can, and we never do that with Beckett or Bonnie. And so that's how, that's one of the ways we're doing this experiment to, to just see, are they going to have a cavity or not? And so if somebody has gingivitis, who's watching this, or they know somebody, if you know somebody with gingivitis and you're like, oh yeah, man, their gums are messed up. Share this video with them, okay? Because what Dr. Stock is telling is is saying is going to literally change their life. Because gingivitis is not just oh, I have a disease in my gums. We're talking about bad breath. We're talking about you don't like the way your smile looks. We're talking about social. We're talking about inner, you know, interpersonal stuff. It, it like it can mess with your mental health yeah. if your gingivitis is bad enough. So if somebody had gingivitis, this is what I would recommend. And I want you to correct me if I'm wrong and, and tell me what you would add to this. I would say, number one, eliminate all sugar from your diet. Number two, eliminate all grains from your diet. Number three, eliminate all vegetable seed oils from your diet. Number four, eliminate, stop smoking, stop any tobacco that's going in your mouth, whether you dip, chew, smoke, whatever, I don't care. Um, stop that. And then add lots of fatty meat, add lots of eggs with the yolk, add some seafood. Uh, you might need to add some vitamin D, K2, depending on your diet. If you're eating foods rich in those, you probably don't even have to add that at all. And I've got a video on vitamin D and vitamin K rich foods on this channel. And then add collagen building block foods. And I don't mean a collagen supplement. I mean, eat the gristle in your steak. I mean, eat the cartilage off the end of the chicken bone. I mean, eat the, the membrane on the back of your ribs. Those are free collagen supplements. Eat those things. What would you change? What, what Where did I get wrong? Well, I would say two things came to mind. One is not if someone knows anyone with gingivitis, because 50% of U.S. adults have periodontitis. That is oh, the advanced form. I didn't and realize it's kind of like pre-diabetes would be gingivitis. So if 50% of U.S. adults have periodontitis, I'm talking 70% of people have some degree of gum disease. So it's not if you know, it's like everyone you know has it. So share this video with everyone you know. Uh, this, <laughs> secondly, I would add one thing to your list. And it's not anything to eat. It is when you are eating and throughout the day and when you're sleeping, every time, all throughout the day, except for when you're talking, Keep your mouth shut. We need to be breathing wow. through our nose. Mm -hmm. Mouth breathing is going to dry out the mouth. It's going to, which is, it's going to take away that salivary flow. It's going to lead to dis dysbiosis. And so, even if you're having, uh, let's say, a, you're eating a really good diet, that's going to increase your risk of uh, cavities, but also worsening gingivitis, periodontal disease, all kind of the oral health stuff. So, actually, breathing through your nose, keeping the mouth shut, proper oral posture is very, very important. I love it. I love it. Another question from a tribe member. Uh, have a 25-year-old implant causing problems, boneless near the tooth and inflammation. Could this be a reaction to the metal in the implant? If so, can the implant be replaced? That's a great question. Uh, a lot comes to mind here. So interestingly, I get, I get tons of questions about root canals. Because uh, yes, we're going to talk about that. A lot of justified fears of, around getting a root canal and all the potential sequel, negative sequela associated with root canals. But I also always like to play, I don't like it, but I do play devil's advocate because let's say you, you're not going to get a root canal and you're like, all right, I'm going to get the tooth taken out. Well, you're going to have a gap or you're going to do something. And there's some options like you can do a bridge where you got to cut down a neighboring teeth. Uh, you can do partial, which a lot of people don't like partial dentures. And so the common thing that today's are implants. Everyone thinks implant, ah, take the tooth out, put an implant, but implants are not without their own potential downsides as, uh, we can see here from this community member. Uh, and so implants are tough because you want to have a biocompatible material ideally. And so titanium is a metal. It's not super biocompatible. You really don't want all these metals in your mouth if you can prevent it. And so what you can use is, I guess if, if I'm to recommend one would be there's ceramic implants today, which are like the most biocompatible, but only basically a biologic dentist is kind of like a functional healthcare dentist. Only a handful of dentists are even placing uh, these ceramic implants because they are technique sensitive as well. And so, yes, the question was like, could this metal have caused the reaction and like, 
I, I, I've heard so many horror stories with implants. Uh, the general recommendation I'd give someone is if you find a biologic dentist that does ceramic implants, I'd go with that route. If not, I would go to a periodont uh, a periodontist or an oral surgeon who does lots of them. Because a general dentist, you don't know what you're going to get sometimes. Everyone knows someone that's like, hey, this is a fantastic dentist. And this dentist is maybe not so fantastic. And you have no idea to know what is what. And this is true in, I think, all professions. I know certain physical therapists you can go to, they could probably heal any pain you have. And you go to another one and you're going to be in pain for the next, for the rest of your life. So I, th that's kind of the long-winded answer to, to that question. Oh, I love it. I love it. Now, how many people watching this right now have tooth envy looking at this guy's smile, <laughs> right? I do. I know I'm trying not to smile because he's making me look bad. Another tribe member, uh, Root Canals. What are your thoughts on that? And I still also, Mer let's get mercury fillings out of the way too, because I think they're all relevant and need to be talked about. Uh, I lost a tooth recently in a, a farm incident. It was a uh, back molar, third molar, which as you know, are not easy to lose. You can imagine the uh, traumatic forces involved there. <laughs> Uh, but I'm, I don't care. I'm not going to get an implant. I'm not going to do a partial. I'm not going to do anything. Now, if it was this tooth, I'd probably go, well, you know, I probably need to do something. But so many people have asked me about root canals. And my current advice is do not do that. Do not do that. Just go pay a dentist 120 bucks to have the tooth pull, pulled. And then if you want to get a partial later, you can. It's not that big of a deal. Am I wrong with that advice? No, I think your advice is pretty much spot on. First of all, thank you for the teeth compliment. But I worth mentioning is not all is going right in here. And so I'd like to point out a few bad things that we can go down rabbit holes later if we want. But like I have very narrow dental arch. So if I smile, you can see, you can see them all. black yeah. triangles in the corner. Those should be where teeth should be there. I right, have this right. narrow dental arch. So you don't want that. And when I smile real big, I'm trying not to do. But I have a gummy smile, which oh. looks like, like my jaws have fallen, right? And right. so also bad. Uh, so thank you for the compliment. Those are those are diet induced problems, orthodontic problems. We can go down that rabbit hole if we want. Uh, but let's get to the question at hand. Thoughts on root canals and crowns and mercury fillings. Yeah. So for example, I don't have my wisdom teeth. They got taken out because all my teeth didn't fit into my mouth. So the oral surgeon had to cut those out when I was just a teenager. But if I lost a second molar, those are the next ones back, I would just leave it out. I definitely would not replace that. If I lost a first molar, that I don't know what I would do in this situation. <laughs> Not for aesthetic reasons, but if you get a tooth taken out, what will happen is back teeth will will move. So th yeah. this will change your occlusion. You're not going to die, but it's not ideal. Right. Uh, so th there's side effects of uh, consequences of not doing anything. So what are our options? It could be a partial. It could be an implant. We can do a bridge. Those are the three probably most common. Bridges, uh, very hard to clean if you get a bridge. Uh, you have to... In order to have a bridge, you have to have two teeth next to it. And if those are two healthy teeth, two virgin teeth is what we call them, you have to literally cut those teeth down. As a dentist, hate cutting into virgin teeth. You have these, right? You don't, you, I just, I don't like it. Uh, and so, and the partials I mentioned, you have to, it's kind of like wearing a retainer. And a lot of people don't want to wear a retainer all day long. And so then it comes to uh, implants, what we just talked about implants. And so... If someone's going to get a root canal, I, I have mixed feelings about root canals because we have all these other potential issues of the other treatment options. If someone is to get a root canal, one thing I recommend is like I recommend it with the implants. If you go to an endodontist who does a great job, it mitigates the risk that is associated with a lot of the root canals. Because a lot of, if you think about what a root canal is, it's basically a dead tooth and a dentist or an endodontist which is what I'm going to recommend going to as a specialist. They're going to go into the tooth. They're going to clean out the nerve. They're going to clean out the, the vasculature, the pulp, the blood supply, and they're going to fill it with gutta percha. But the thing is, we have these root canals, but we also have all these accessory canals. And so if a great job is done, the root canals are sealed, accessory canals, canals are sealed. And so the bacterial infection that was in it is going to be eliminated because we sealed out all the basically, let's call it the food that the bacteria is going to eat on and then but if, if the root canal is not done great, you can have this chronic little infection where these bacteria are always eating on this tooth. And so that's a huge problem. Uh, and so in that case, I would not, uh, you don't want that. And getting the tooth taken out is a way better solution than having some chronic infection, basically. And so, so like, it's like, do you want to leave a dead organ 
in your body. We don't do that anywhere else. Like right. you've got a dead organ, it's coming out, right? Yep, exactly. So I'm very cautious of root canals, but I also recognize the alternatives. There's also risk associated with the, with the alternatives. And so weighing everything in dentistry, probably like most medicine, you got these cost benefit analysis. I think the, a big problem in dentistry and probably medicine as well is I don't think the, the, the risk benefits are communicated as well to a patient so they can make an informed uh, decision. Absolutely. Because you know, the, the, the dentist uh, Mercedes payment is contingent on the patient agreeing <laughs> to have the root canal. Therefore they're not going to really say, now look, you know, and give them the full. And so they patients are really doing this without true informed consent, in my opinion. Yeah. And I don't think that's, I think that's no bueno. Now let's get back to cavities. Yep. When I was a, I, when I was a kid, Granny Berry made me go to the dentist. She would also hold me down uh, if I didn't brush my teeth to her liking and brush my teeth until my gums bled and we had to floss and we had these little red tablets you had to chew up and it would show if you missed any spots when you were brushing. I remember the dentist telling me, look, don't be drinking sodas and don't be eating that hard, sticky candy. And I've been told that multiple times by the by by multiple dentists, and so I think that's probably the standard dietary advice. Otherwise, everything's fair game. But in my reading in anthropology, grains and the acids that they contain and the sugars that they break down into are a huge, huge deal. Now, there's all these conspiracies out on the internet. Some are like, "Yeah, dentists pay the bills with filling cavities, therefore they're not going to tell you." I don't believe that. I think the average dentist, contrary to what I was taught in medical school, I think the average dentist is an ethical, moral person. They don't want you to have a cavities that you have to come in and get filled. Why do dentists not tell people it's not just sticky candy and, and soft drinks? It's way more than that. Why don't they tell people that? It, it's all very true, everything you're just saying. So for, first of all, cavities are the most common disease in the world. So Dentists really don't need to trick you into needing cavities because they're so abundant. Like, <laughs> like their their practice isn't going to suffer uh, for lack of cavities. There, it's believe me, I'm out there. I feel like in rural Missouri, I could spend the rest of my life just yep. going crazy trying to fix all the cavities. As fast as you fix them, they're reforming, right? So you fix a cavity, you do a filling. That tooth is not set for the rest of its life. You if you don't get your you know, your diet in order, you got to be redoing that filling in no time. Uh, so I, I do as well. I think most dentists are well-intentioned. Uh, what's interesting is even Smile America Partners, company I work for, well-intentioned company, like I feel like they're doing good work. We're going to areas where there's not dentist and it's low socioeconomic, it's Medicaid patients, but even the training they give us dentists because they give us, you know, CE training and things like that. They're showing us, oh, you give candy to the kids after they leave, you know, good job. Here's your, get your candy on the way out. I'm like, what? I mean, it's good for a repeat business, but that's crazy, right? And that's kind of like, it tells you a little something right there. Uh, but it's not just, it's not just sugar and it's not just sticky candies. Although those are definitely contribute to your cavities. Sure, sure. And they're uh, probably the worst. They're probably the worst of all, I, I would guess. The reality. That's not the whole story. And like you said, giving the, a kid candy after the dentist visit, that's like if you're if you're a recovering alcoholic and you're going to AA and they're like, hey, man, you've been a really beer. good. You're almost in time. You, you've come to multiple meetings. Here's a beer. Exactly. Exactly. It's crazy. Uh, but no, you're right. It's so it's carbohydrates. Like what you mentioned, like what we see in the fossil record is with the a turn of in, in the Neolithic when we start agriculture, we see this dramatic rise in cavities in the Americas. We see it with uh, uh, the with corn consumption, and we can document isotopes. Uh, in, to, we we look at the isotopes in teeth, and we can deduce C three C four foods, and we can we can basically see like what were these people eating? We see the the correlation between corn consumption and cavities yeah. is a, a beautifully R squared correlation fit. Uh, and so, like Absolutely. you said, it is it's 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 these crops, the grains, corn, wheat, uh, as well as uh, it got worse with the industrial revolution because when we refine these especially sugar, but they, they have more surface area to ferment. So it just gets worse. And then if it's sticking on your teeth, of course, it's even worse. Uh, but you're right. It's, it's actually carbohydrates uh, in general. And when I talk about cavities, I talk about carbs in general. I think most dentists, although we are basically told, I would say required to do nutritional counseling, 
I, I feel like most dentists feel like they step out of their lane if they recommend a low carbohydrate diet because the ADA is not telling us to recommend a low carbohydrate diet. Although right. I believe the research and as a dentist, and we know carbohydrates are responsible for the most common disease in the world. I feel like it's an ethical duty for a dentist. Like all dentists should be recommending a low carbohydrate diet. Uh, I mean, that would put our profession at risk if everyone did it. Um, but I, I, I mean, that's what I believe. Like all dentists should be I mean, hyper carnivores. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And there's actually multiple examples in the archaeological literature. Uh, no, first of all, the Egyptians, right? Sugar hadn't even been invented yet. There was no such thing as cane sugar or beet sugar or any sugar. They maybe occasionally had some honey, but otherwise there was zero sugar. And their dental health is atrocious. Yep. And in Egypt, everybody got mummified unless they were a prisoner or a pauper. You got some degree of mummification plus the, the atmosphere there is just perfect to dry out and, and save fossils, right? And so even they, they were they were basically eating the diet that the American Heart and Dental and, and Medical Association tell us to eat now. Yep. Lots of whole grain breads. And there was no GMO wheat back then. It was the actual real ancient grains, whole wheat, and their dental health is terrible. And then a second example is in the Kentucky, Indiana area. Uh, 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 Native Americans before the Europeans got here, there was one tribe that was still primarily a hunter-gatherer tribe. And then there was another tribe that had learned about corn and, and they were predominantly corn and, and other uh, grain farmers. Yep. And the hunter-gatherers had zero cavities. But as soon as you cross whatever river it was, to where the other people, they just lived on corn and other, you know, other root tubers and stuff like that. Their dental health is atrocious. And this is at the same latitude, same part of the country. There's like literally there was no difference between these people, not even a time difference. They just had different diets and cavities were unknown on one side of the river and common on the other side of the river. Now, here's a good question from Neil. Pros and cons of switching to a fluoride free toothpaste. Any concerns? with charcoal or other natural agreement of uh, many people in our tribe use either Redmond's earth paste or they use the unfluoridated Tom's because that's what I recommend. Uh, answer this question. And then we're going to talk about fluoride and I'm going to reveal something that I did in my past that, that uh, this is going to be a world pre premiere of this admission because no, many, very few people know I did this. So a toothpaste is a, is a, it's actually, it's a big conversation, believe it or not. Um, Activated charcoal, charcoal toothpaste, I actually don't recommend because they are abrasive. And right. the last thing you want to do is be, you know, scratching away your enamel. Um, so I generally don't recommend uh, charcoal toothpaste. Now, whenever, whenever anyone asks me what kind of toothpaste I should use, the first thing I need to be like, well, what's your diet? And then next thing is what's your goals? Because there's a lot of things in toothpaste, for example like the the mint flavor, right? You don't need that, but maybe your partner would like that before you kiss her goodnight, okay? So that right. might be something you want. Peroxide in toothpaste, it's for whitening. And so if you want white teeth, that might be an ingredient that you consider, but you don't need peroxide right. in your mouth. Right. We already talked about sterilizing the mouth with, um, <laughs> right, with uh, antibacterials. So there's other ingredients, SLS, which is like the classic foaming agent. It, it's literally there just to give you a nice feel. So we start talking about like what in the ingredients are you actually looking for in a toothpaste? And so some of the things people are actually looking for is the sodium bicarbonate. That's baking soda. What baking soda is going to do is going to increase the pH, which is going to make it easier to remineralize your teeth. So in conjunction with baking soda, maybe you want a remineralization agent. That's what fluoride would classically be used for to help remineralize the teeth. Now, we're going to talk about fluoride, so we can just skip over that for now. So, but it still has a remineralization agent. What I would recommend over that is hydroxyapatite. And so hydroxyapatite is actually what your teeth are made of, like bioidentical. Now, I am not yet on the pure hydroxyapatite advocate train. I'm hoping I will get there someday. But there's basically two, we'll, we'll say there's two kinds of hydroxyapatite. Regular, which is macro, big particles. And then you have nano hydroxyapatite. Nano hydroxyapatite is the stuff that works. Well, there's needle and then there's rod shaped. You don't want needle, okay? So rod shaped hydroxyapatite. But I think there are still legitimate concerns about you about using nano hydroxyapatite, the nano small particles that could potentially cause problems. It's mostly been, I'll say, cleared in the research as safe and effective. So 
I won't, I, I'll say I can recommend it. Um, <laughs> but I, I just, I want to caveat, I still have reservations about it. Uh, but the, but the, but the hydroxyapatite with larger particles is not as effective. So, so take that with what you will. And then fluoride, which we're going to talk about is also, you know, has all kinds of toxicity problems. Uh, so I don't think there's a perfect remineralization agent besides your saliva. So what I think is like the best thing is just having a great diet, using an electric toothbrush that has soft bristles. Water is really all you need. <laughs> really, you don't even need that. But that's, you know, that's kind of baseline. And if you're adding ingredients on top of that, I would add them for a reason. Like you don't have an ideal diet. So, hey, let's throw some baking soda with some remineralization agent in it. And there's all kinds of brands. Boca is a good one. Uh, no BS toothpaste. There's a few number of brands out there that I think do the job. You mentioned Tom's, which I think is probably fine. Um, but there's lots of ingredients in toothpaste. If you just look at the ingredient list that can potentially be toxic. And I say potentially because toxic has to do with what's the dose, what's the duration, how frequently are you using it? So if you just use it once a tiny dose and you don't do it all the time, yeah, well, you're probably fine. But oral hygiene is some of those things we're doing multiple times a day, day after day, decade after decade. So these things can add up. And I have a list of toothpaste ingredients to avoid. It's like 100 items long. So so maybe we won't dive into that, but that's just uh, my thoughts around toothpaste. Excellent. Uh, one more toothpaste question and then um, one more question about cavities. So I was taught as a child to brush my teeth aggressively, almost militantly, right? Can you, do people brush their teeth too much? Is that a thing? And and what happens if, you, if you're too aggressive and brush your teeth? Too, can you brush your teeth too often? How many times a day should you brush? And then a, a question about cavities. I see reports constantly online that, and I don't know the exact grading of, of caries. I don't know what the official, I'm sure it's an eponymous that's named after some famous dentist, but a, a grade one or a grade two cavity. I see people when they go on a, a ketovore carnivore diet that their dentist is like, I thought you, I had, we were going to fill that cavity, but it's not there anymore. Can early cavities, can they remineralize and go away? And then do people brush their too, teeth too much? Can they? Okay. So first, can people brush their teeth too much? I would say yes, especially if you're using old school toothbrush that can have firm bristles. And that can be a leading cause of recession. The recession, a number of things can cause recession. But that for sure can do it. You brush your teeth three times a day with a hard toothbrush, recede away your gum. So you definitely can do too much. Um I'd say that's probably the number one risk, dis despite um, depending on what kind of toothpaste you're using on it, right? So if you're using some right. super high PPM fluoridated toothpaste and you're swallowing it, I would I would <laughs> I wouldn't do that. Uh, so yes, you can. I think that's most people most people's oral health problems are not related to brushing too too often. Uh, like I said, if you're eating a good diet, we see from like the historical record. You don't even have to brush your teeth. You're not going to get cavities and things like that. Um, I brush my teeth twice a day, electric toothbrush and water in the morning. In the evening, I might use a comically small amount of toothpaste. I try different ones. And sometimes that's just for the cosmetic stuff more, more than anything. Like, yep. hey, maybe we'll get a little bit of whitening, remove some extrinsic staining, maybe a little bit of fresh breath if my girlfriend will kiss me or something like that. So <laughs> <laughs> that's how I think about uh, the toothpaste uh, too much, too often, how to go about that. Regarding the remineralization, that's a great question. So the grading, you'll see here about a class one, class two, class three. That actually just tells you like where the cavity is. So like a class one cavity is on the biting surface. The occlusal surface is what it's called. And a class two is a cavity that's in between your teeth. And so th those are frequently caused by those sugar drinks. Uh, and one reason why dentists recommend flossing is to clean in between your teeth because to prevent class two cavities. Uh, if you have a cavity that's still in the enamel, and so you have an enamel, you think a way to, way to think about it, that's the outer covering of the tooth. Underneath the enamel, you have the dentin. That's kind of like, if you think about an apple, you have the apple peel. We'll call that the enamel. The meat of the apple would be the dentin. And the core of the apple, it's called the pulp. That's a, the nerve and the vasculature of the tooth. Once a cavity gets into the meat of the apple, the dentin, as a dentist, we're taught, hey, that's a filling. You need to fix that. Because the dentin is softer than the enamel. Once a cavity gets there, it can start moving fast towards the pulp. You don't want it to get to the pulp because then you need root canal or extraction or one of those things we talked about earlier. Uh, and so if it is still in the enamel, definitely re possible to reverse it. 
Um, in fact, I recommend like that's what you should try and do. If you have a patient that's going to, you know, listen to oral hygiene or dietary strategies, like if it's still in the enamel, I wouldn't touch it. But some dentists do because they're like, hey, this person's not going to do the right diet or so let's just take care of it now. And so a lot of that has to do with what their history is, what their current situation is, things like that. But yeah, you can absolutely reverse We'll call it reverse, but it's really just remineralize uh, a cavity. And frequently what you'll see is you have this radio lucency in the x-ray. And so a dentist, we can see that. Yep. And it's not yet to the dentin. And we're like, hey, let's try and reverse this. And frequently you'll, you should still likely will still see that radio lucency in subsequent appointments, but it won't progress. So it, it'll re remineralize. And you absolutely can do it. And the things we've talked about today are like the ways to do it. Diet is primary. <laughs> Beautiful. I love it. And so what, when it gets, when you compromise the enamel and the cavities into the dentin, any chance of reversing that or does that need to be filled? You still can uh, arrest that decay and you can still remineralize it. Um, most dentists, well, maybe some will wash it with you. They will progress at different rates. So let's say you're on a six year, six month recall or maybe a month recall. And they're like, Hey, let's wait, let's wait and watch that. And it's in the dentin. Most dentists are going to not going to be like, let's, first of all, that's, that's a liability. They could lose their license. If it's in the dent and they say, let's watch it. And the next appointment, you need a root canal. A patient could say, Hey, right. that's minimal practice. <laughs> now I need a root canal. It could have been a filling. So you'll have dentists that just aren't going to do that, <laughs> but that doesn't mean you can't do it. So a, den a filling definitely can be uh, arrested when it's in the dent. And a lot of Western a price work, um, which we can talk about more about that, uh, Dr. Weston Price also, but he he found this group where they were doing trading, uh, the trading trading Copra for sugar, and they got all these cavities. But then the Copra trade stopped, and so they, they this, these people had stopped getting the sugar, and they all like they arrested all these cavities arrested before they got too too bad. So it was an interesting kind of case study. Very interesting. Oh, so Bob wants us to just clear up when we're talking about gingivitis and periodontitis. Are we talking about that a proper human diet can can help? and reverse the damage that's already been done? Uh, or are we just talking about lessening further damage? So gingivitis, you can totally reverse it. That is uh, inflammatory gum condition. And yeah, you can absolutely reverse that. Periodontitis, I, I will say with a proper human diet, you can definitely arrest the progression of the disease. That should be your goal, I would say. If you get a, attachment, gain, regaining attachment, re, you know, whether it's bone or periodontal ligament, et cetera, that's bonus. But uh, the goal is in that situation, hey, let's stop the progression of the disease. Now, fluoride. Are you ready? Because uh, we, we might get a strike for this. I don't know. So <laughs> let me, I'll tell you the quick story. World premiere of this hidden information about Dr. Berry. Back in 2013 or 2014, I was practicing full time and had been doing a ton of research about fluoride and stuff when I was just kind of becoming aware that, you know, maybe what we eat and what the chemicals we put in our body, maybe that matters. Uh, I was I led the uh, a movement that got fluoride removed from the Camden City Municipal Water Supply. We got a three to two vote on the city council and they, they voted to take it out of the water supply. And there were dentists who came who traveled for that city council meeting hours and were chastising me and berating me saying, you're going to cause an epidemic of, of, ca of cavities and dental abscesses, children. They, these are very serious infections in children. And I said, well, I'll tell you what docs, because I knew I was going to win the vote because I'd been working on this for month, months before I ever stood up. And I said, I want you to keep up with the amount of dental caries that you see in your practice and dental abscesses and come to me in three months, six months, nine months, 12 months, five years. I don't care if you come back to me and you show me in black and white that this is causing a noticeable uptick in cavities and dental abscesses. I'll come right back in front of this city council and I will I will I will absolutely demand that they they turn overturn this vote. And they all agreed. By God, yes, that's you. You'll hear you'll be hearing from me. And that's been that was 2013, Kevin. Yep. And I've yet I've yet to hear from one of those dentists. So either they lost count because the care the cavities are so bad, or they're so busy, you know, hospitalizing kids with dental abscesses that they don't have time to call me. But I suspect that they haven't seen any uptick in cavities at all. Did it is what I did? Is that something I should be proud of, or should I be ashamed of that? Did I hurt the children in in Camden, Tennessee? What's your thoughts on fluoridated water? 
man, I would I would say you're a hero in the county because we don't even know how many IQ points of children you could have potentially saved. And so fluoride is extremely controversial. Like you said, this could easily get a strike and, you know, whatever. Uh, but it is controversial because it is a nuanced discussion. And like you said, like the the the, the old guard, ADA, dentist, like if you recommend not having fluoridated water, you are just outcast crazy. I'll tell you what, I, well, first of all, I filter the fluoride out of my water. If I had kids, I would not even let them put it in their mouth. <laughs> so, and this story, we could talk about many things. So fluoride potentially has all kinds of potential adverse consequences. To me, the biggest one is the neurologic toxicity of growing children. And the research, research various like good research puts puts it on potential par with lead as far as reduction in IQ. Like this is like it's not just a small amount. That is, and what I like to tell people like the the largest dental survey ever done with these kids fluoridated water, um, t- like massive survey showed maybe one dental surface cavity could be prevented. Maybe. I can fix a one cavity uh, dental, you know, in a few minutes. Look, I can't fix a brain. So right. when we talk about the risk reward, the it is so skewed in the risk category to me that it's that it's crazy because the reward, like you mentioned, if there if it did help prevent cavities to some minuscule disease uh, amount, it is a it's a small reward with very serious <laughs> potential downsides. If you think about a drop of five five points of IQ, it is actually quite substantial, which is some people have linked with fluoridated water. Further, we are treating a topical issue with a systemic solution. And so most of the fluoride research that shows effectiveness shows it as a topical application, not a systemic, let's drink a ton of water and see if we can get stronger teeth, like kind of crazy. Um, and so, yeah, this, this the fluoride history is substantial. And the, maybe it helps prevent cavities slightly topically. I don't even think water fluoridation, if at all, it's a very small amount. Um, topically, perhaps a little bit. Right. And it's different from a three-year-old using a fluoridated toothpaste that's going to s- potentially swallow it and is still growing versus a grown adult using a small amount on toothpaste that they're spitting it out. Those right. are two different scenarios. <laughs> and so and it's worth mentioning the other potential side effects of drinking fluoridated water on an ongoing basis. It's linked with hypothyroidism. You mentioned your wife. So fluorine is a halogen, which is, which similar to iodine, also a halogen on the periodic table. These can compete for uptake in the thyroid. And so we see in communities that have fluoridated water have higher rates of um, hypothyroid, hypothyroidism. So we see thyroid effects. It can calcify soft tissues like the pineal gland, which can mess with melatonin production. It, can be it is uptaken in the bones to make hard bones but brittle bones like so you're more likely to have fractures uh the, the potential side effects go on and on kidney damage uh to me the biggest one and maybe it's because i do pediatric dentistry is um because i feel for these kids and like they're they don't have a decision in this matter and look if i'm drinking water it's gonna drop my iq five points it's a substantial amount that's gonna have lifelong consequences uh yeah. for what especially Tenthly, especially yeah. for a kid who's already perhaps disadvantage multiple exactly. different ways, socioeconomically, regionally, geographically, you already are kind of behind the eight ball. And then we're going to start you off. We're going to make all your formula with fluoridated water. Your mom drank fluoridated water the entire time she was pregnant with you. What's, I mean, I've seen some studies up to 10 IQ points, but I think that yeah. the average of the good studies is kids probably lose five IQ points. Yeah. And I, that, you know, if you're already starting from a disadvantaged position, that's that's freaking huge. Yep. And so I'm so glad the city council members in, in, in Camden, Tennessee, saw the wisdom of taking this out of the water supply. So so I don't feel too bad about doing that. Now, no. let's let's shift gears and let's talk about I, I believe that our gut microbiome is very important. I think everybody believes that. But what many people like you, you alluded to earlier, a lot of people think that for to have a healthy mouth, your mouth should be sterile. You should kill every bacteria in your mouth multiple times a day. 
that will give you good dental health and oral health. And I believe that's absolutely false. I think we have a, an oral microbiome that when you're eating a proper human diet, self adjusts. I think it goes back to that healthy microbiome that we had in the pre-industrial days. And I don't like to call it the industrial revolution. I like to call it the, industri- the, the, the agricultural revolution. I like to call it the agricultural downfall because a lot of things went south when we started getting the predominance of our calories from grains. What about the 88? <clears throat> I was on their website when I did my oral microbiome video. All these dental rinses, antimicrobial, antimicrobial, antimicrobial. Should we try to carpet bomb the bacteria in our mouth or should we leave them alone? Should we, should we be using lots of peroxide, which is an antimicrobial? It kills, it carpet bombs bacteria in your mouth. Should we be using antimicrobial mouthwashes and rinses that even if they have the ADA stamp approval on them, is that good or bad? I would use those only if someone thinks like, yeah, taking a broad spectrum antibiotic every day would be good for my gut health. Like that's an obscene th- thought. No one's right. doing that. No right. one's recommending that. Yeah. Take, um, this, but- take this Levaquin once a day for the rest of your life so to daily carpet bomb your gut bacteria. Right. Like you said, most people appreciate the importance of the microbiome in the gut. The, we have these bacteria that we have a symbiotic relationship with. Very important from producing short chain fatty acids to you name it, like, like extremely important. In yes. the mouth, it, they also play a very important role. They play an important role. We, we mentioned nitric oxide production, but they also play a very important role on your teeth. They facil, uh, facilitate exchange between uh, minerals. So like when we're trying to remineralize our teeth, we need someone to help guide that process. This bacteria, which will form, so you have a tooth, it'll form a pellicle and a, mic, and a biofilm. That biofilm plays that a very important role in protecting your teeth. So no, the goal is not to just sterilize the mouth and it's interesting that that's even a controversial kind of thing. Like, a, <laughs> But it is because I, I think a lot of oral mouthwash products have moved away from alcohol-based ones because they were like, okay, this can lead to oral cancer. But like you said, they're still promoting antiseptic mouthwashes, which to me, there's just no basis for doing that. Uh, yeah, it's not going to fix your dysbiosis by nuking all the bacteria. You eat the same diet. It's going to, like you said, it is reactive to the diet that we have, the oral microbiome. So it will react to the food that you're putting into it. You continue to put the same bad food in it. You're going to get the same results, whether you're using antiseptic or not. Yeah. And and back to the gingivitis again, I think that most dentists at least used to, if not still do, if you have gingivitis, one of the steps they do to fight that is to prescribe one of these ADA approved antimicrobial rinses as if it's the bacteria, you know, the bacteria is what's causing your gingivitis. Yep. I, I do know some periodontists uh, that will, I think Dr. Al Dannenberg, he, he is a, was a periodonta, uh, periodontitis, uh, periodontist, excuse me, but treating periodontitis, he would uh, prescribe chlorhexidine, which is like this very strong sure. antibacterial. And I think short term, certain things like certain like medicine, if we're going to use this short term, let's get the disease process under control and then get off it. That's yep. one thing. No one, you don't want to use chlorhexidine on an ongoing base, basis, you know, forever. No, like you don't, you just don't want to do that. And that's kind of how I feel about general, you know, medications, therapeutic stuff. Like, hey, if you're going to use it for a little bit to get in shape, all right. But then the goal should be, let's get off this. Yeah, I totally, I totally agree. Thank you for that. Let's talk about mercury fillings. Another very hot topic. There are people on the internet who say, that if you've got one or two mercury fillings, it's not a big deal. Don't worry about it. There are other people say, that say that if you've got even one tiny mercury filling, that is going to cause brain cancer. And it's just, it's literally, you might as well have a mouthful of cancer. You've got to go to a specific kind of dentist, get that removed immediately, and it has to be removed properly. Or the fumes from the mercury, you'll inhale them. And then here's a whole nother can of worms. Are mercury fillings a big deal? And if so, should we have them removed? How many mercury fillings? How big before you're like, yeah, dude, you need to get that shit taken out of your mouth right now. <laughs> Give us the scoop on this. I would say I fall somewhere in between the two extremes. I think they are a big deal. 
And I would prefer, I mean, most dentists have phased them out at this point, but not all. I was telling you, I, I mean, 10 years ago, I graduated from dental school in 2013. So it's been a decade. So, but prior to that, Mike, we're using amalgam in dental school back then. I, whether they still do it today, I don't know. Uh, but it is a big deal. And I fall somewhere in the middle of that spectrum, meaning, like you said, a very important thing. If you're going to get your mercury fillings taken out, often the insult of that mercury filling removal is worse than the exposure you would have had the rest of your life. Okay. So if you're going to get that mercury filling taken out, you need to do it with great care. They need to have the right suction, all the protocol. And most dentists I know are not going to do that. So you need to go to probably a biologic dentist again uh, to get that done. Um, if you have lots of mercury fillings, every time you're drinking your hot coffee or you're, you're leaching small amounts of mercury on a daily basis, uh, more, more likely than not, if you're not drinking coffee and your mouth's always shut, you're not breathing through your mouth, probably less. Um, but you are getting some small amount of toxic exposure. And if it's small enough, like, like, like we've talked about a little bit, if the dose and frequency and duration is really going to determine if this is toxic. So what is the dose of mercury you're getting? And you, because it is in your mouth, you're getting it frequently. You're getting it all day. And if you keep that mercury filling in for the rest of your life, you're getting it the rest of your life. So we, it has the potential to lead up to a toxicity for sure. So I would prefer to get them taken out and replaced. You have to take in <laughs> the devil's advocate. The other filling materials are not perfect. And I think there's a belief that, oh, these composite white, they're plastic. Like you're, they got these plastics potentially have issues as well as they don't last as long. They leak. Uh, they're more likely to have recurrent decay, things like that. So, uh, it's gold is a good option. A lot of people don't want gold and <laughs> also a metal, which we want to limit. So it's also where we have to measure the risk and benefits you got. So I'm not a fan of mercury fillings. I wouldn't put them in myself. Um, but if you're going to get to take them out, I would do caution. If you have one or two small mercury fillings, you've been okay. Uh, they they were well done. I I probably wouldn't rush to take them out. So I, I that's probably going to upset both sides of the spectrum. <laughs> Wait, you got to take those out um, versus no, you got to leave them all in. But I, I I would use my judgment uh, to try and do that on a case by case basis. I would say. So if somebody has a mouthful of mercury fillings, and many people do, they should probably go talk to a biologic dentist and say, hey. What, what would be the plan? What's the, cause I'm sure it's not cheap to do that. Yeah. And then also you would probably recommend if you're going to do that, those, the, the newer type fillings are not perfect. So you really need to fix your diet yep. probably before you have the mercury fillings removed or you're just going to decay around that and cause a bigger problem. Absolutely. I mean, that's spot on. Man, this has been amazing. Thank you so much for doing this. Close this out for us, Dr. Stock, practicing dentist, practicing in rural Missouri. What what does if somebody's just like, OK, I haven't heard any of this. This is all brand new to me. What do I need to do to reverse my gingivitis to stop having a, a new cavity every time I see the doctor every six dentist every six months? What do I need to do to take care of my oral microbiome? Wrap this up and put a bow on it for us, doctor. I would like to keep it simple for people. I think what you teach is primary importance, a proper human diet and understanding what that is. And my recommendation in that regard is a, hy a hyper carnivorous diet where basically I, I believe we are hyper carnivores, like a species appropriate diet. I mean, which means omnivores, we're omnivores. We can eat plants and animals, but omnivores, most omnivores specialize in plants or animals and omnivores that specialize in eating animals 70 plus percent of their diet are called hyper carnivores. And I believe that's what we should be. So I think people should, should err towards hyper carnivorous diet, 70 plus percent meat, uh, species appropriate, proper human diet. That's going to be take you the furthest. The second thing I'd recommend you do is start checking your mouth. If you are breathing out of your mouth, cl close that mouth, uh, breathe through your nose. We didn't talk all that much about breathing today, which is maybe a, a discussion for another time. Yes. Uh, but I think that is one of the most underappreciated things is we don't breathe properly today. And a lot of it has to do with, the craniofacial development inadequacies that result from improper diets. And so those are kind of two things. Eat a proper diet, breathe through your nose, keep that mouth shut, tongue up against the palate in the resting position. And next time you go to the dentist, you're not going to have that gingivitis. You aren't going to have to get all your fillings redone and you'll be in good shape. Oh, beautiful, beautiful summation.
And I believe that will probably carry on to systemic health too. We didn't really talk about the oral systemic. I think, so too. I think you're right. I think a healthy mouth and healthy teeth, healthy gums probably equals healthier body as well. Yeah, yeah I totally agree. Guys watching this, I've included all of Dr. Stock's links down in the show notes. Uh, if you're like, okay, proper human diet, but what the hell is that? Join our private community. There's thousands of people in there who are on this journey with me to rediscover a proper human diet. What is that? What does it look like? And how do you eat it every single day for the rest of your life to basically attain the best possible health that you can attain? Dr. Stock has been a great pleasure. Thank you so much, brother. Well, I'll see you soon when we talk about breathing and tongue position and mouth breathing. All right, man. See you later.